Thank you for virtually participating in the 38th Annual Red River Basin Commission Conference. Our discussion will be maintaining the baseline, dam rehabilitation, and the Red River Basin. My name is Zach Herman, and I'm a project engineer from Houston Engineering out of Fargo, North Dakota. When we talk about maintaining the baseline, what we're really talking about is ensuring that we're properly caring for the existing flood storage that exists in the landscape and how that relates to the 20% flow reduction. Before we get into dam rehabilitation in the Red Basin, I do want to touch on the long-term flood solutions. Within the LTFS document, there's a whole suite of alternatives available to accomplish the goals outlined. Our focus will be on retention, specifically the basin-wide flow reduction strategy, which is aimed at reducing peak flows on the red main stem by 20% through implementation of a concept referred to as distributed storage, or flood storage distributed throughout the basin. The basin-wide flow reduction strategy started out by reviewing the 1997 flood event. Tributary hydrographs were reviewed and reasonable reductions to flood hydrographs were made based on assumptions within each tributary. These hydrographs were then analyzed to determine what the cumulative impacts would be on flood flows on the red main stem. Ultimately, what this analysis revealed was that to attain a 20% main stem flow reduction, reduction in flood flows from tributaries on the order of approximately 35% was required throughout the basin. After this initial phase of the basin-wide flow reduction strategy, there became a desire to determine if real sites could be identified on the landscape to accomplish the 20% flow reduction. The first phase of this was the Halstead Upstream Retention Study. What was completed for this was to take a look at the Red River Basin upstream of Halstead, Minnesota, review the landscape using LIDAR data to determine where feasible storage locations existed, analyze those storage locations within tributary hydrologic models, and then take outflows from those models and analyze with the red main stem model to determine if a 20% flow reduction was attainable. Ultimately, what this resulted in was to produce a 20% flow reduction on the Red River main stem from Halstead and upstream. 96 locally identified sites were implemented within the models that provided a total of 560,000 acre feet of flood storage. Those sites were aimed at controlling runoff from the orange areas that you see highlighted on the map on the left. What the modeling showed is that we could attain the 20% flow reduction through implementation of the 96 distributed sites. In fact, we got slightly more than 20% when looking at Halstead and attained a 23% flow reduction, which the hydrographs show on the right. But the focus of today isn't how we attain the 20% flow reduction, rather how do we maintain the baseline of the existing conditions flood storage that exists on the landscape today. Through the Halstead Upstream Retention Study, we analyzed both sites that existed prior to the 1997 flood, as well as those sites that were implemented after the 1997 flood. You can see them indicated on the hydrographs on the right, and also on the map on the left as purple dots for sites before 1997 and red dots for sites after 1997. Using data made available through the states of Minnesota and North Dakota, we were able to identify 132 locations that were constructed for the purposes of flood control within the Red River Basin. Of those, 102 were constructed before the 1997 flood event, and the remaining 30 were constructed after the 1997 flood event. The data also let us look in more detail the timing of implementation of storage sites. As can be seen from the bar charts on the slide, a substantial amount of storage was implemented in North Dakota prior to 1980 and much of it before 1970. So what exactly was going on during this time period that resulted in implementation of so much storage? The Soil Conservation Service, now known as NRCS, was very active in completing small watershed plans throughout North Dakota during this time period. Small watershed plans completed by NRCS within the Red River Basin typically had a focus on flood damage reduction solutions within the localized watersheds in which they were planned. The work that was completed through these small watershed plans was authorized under Public Law 566, and flood storage was often a primary component of how the goals were accomplished within each plan. Now, when we look at the dams within the Red River Basin, we can take a look at which of these dams were implemented through the small watershed program. When we look at the bar chart, we see the dark green bars are representative of the number of dams that were implemented under various time periods within the state of North Dakota. The area of particular focus for NRCS was in northeastern North Dakota, particularly in the counties of Pemina, Cavalier, Walsh, and Grand Forks, where multiple dams were implemented through multiple watershed plans to solve localized flooding issues within each tributary. The dams that are currently under planning for rehabilitation within this region are highlighted with the red stars on the map on the right. 
One of these dams, Renwick Dam, was actually recently completed by NRCS, and the remaining seven are currently in the planning phase. To give a brief overview of watershed rehabilitation through NRCS, the program is authorized through Public Law 566, and rehabilitation is defined as all the work necessary to extend the service life dam and also meet safety and performance standards. Eligible projects include structures that were previously constructed through Public Law 566. Each of the seven structures that are undergoing rehabilitation planning have their own issues that are hoped to be addressed through the rehabilitation of each structure. However, there is significant overlap in the issues that exist within each of these seven structures. Many of the structures were previously designed to a lesser hazard classification and have since been reassigned a higher hazard classification in recognition of increased downstream risk. This leads to inadequate spillway capacities and performance that's not commensurate with the risks that exist downstream. Ultimately, this is a heightened public safety risk for those residing downstream of each dam. Also, each of these dams were constructed with an earthen auxiliary spillway with design standards at the time that have shown to be unstable during activation in other parts of the country. Also, structures consist of aging structural components and uh, hydrology changes have been substantial in many of these watersheds since the implementation. And again, I just want to stress that the issues are unique to each dam. However, there is significant overlap with the issues that hope to be addressed through the rehabilitation of each of these seven structures. We'll be discussing one such structure today to help illustrate some of the issues and challenges that go into planning for rehabilitation of these structures. We'll be looking at Matichek Dam, which was a structure that was constructed between the years of 1964 to 1966 and was actually part of a larger watershed work plan completed by SCS on the middle south branch of the Forest River watershed. The primary purpose of this watershed work plan was to provide flood prevention and recreation opportunities to area residents. Ultimately, the watershed work plan resulted in the implementation of three small watershed dams, a channelization project, land treatment measures, and produced a benefit to cost ratio of 1.65. Now, one thing to note, of the three dams that were implemented as a part of this work plan, both Matichek and Fordville, which is also undergoing watershed rehabilitation planning, were part of this watershed work plan. Now, getting back to Matichek, the storage that's provided by the dam is approximately 7,800 acre feet in total. Of that, 333 acre feet is provided for anticipated accumulated sediments over the life of the project, 5,000 acre feet is provided for flood control, and nearly 2,500 acre feet is provided for recreation in the name of a lake and a fishery upstream of the dam. If we zoom in on the dam, we can take a look at the structure in just a little bit more detail. The dam itself is an on-channel earthen embankment dam that's approximately 76 foot high, located on the middle branch of the Forest River. The dam also provides safe crossing for County Road 14 to get across the Forest River at this location. Through the embankment exists a principal spillway that consists of a concrete riser structure and a box culvert to route flows through the embankment. The purpose of the principal spillway is to attenuate inflows and provide flood damage reduction benefits to points downstream. Once the principal spillway capacity is exceeded, the dam also features an auxiliary spillway that routes flows around the north side of the embankment and down a grass channel to the middle branch of the Forest River. Other amenities provided by the dam include recreation facilities, as you can see coming off of County Road 14. There's a sand beach area, a picnic area, camping, and a boat access at this location right here. Also, further west off the screen, there's facilities provided such as bathrooms, storm shelters, and camping facilities. It's important to note that Matichek Dam was actually designed as a significant hazard structure and was recently redesignated to a high hazard dam. To help illustrate the risk associated with Matichek Dam, I'm going to show you a simulation of the breach of the embankment. Now what you're looking at is the resultant downstream flooding associated with the simulated breach of Matichek Dam. As you can see, the flood progresses from the breach location at the dam to the east, ultimately getting into flatter topography north the community of Forest River where the floodplain begins to expand and become quite expansive. As the flood develops, you can see structures with potential inundation become highlighted as red. Of those structures, several actually present an opportunity for a loss of life, as well as impacts to critical infrastructure such as North Dakota State Highway 32. All of this increased risk downstream of Matichek is what resulted in the change in hazard classification from significant to high hazard. 
The purpose of the rehabilitation of Matichik Dam is to bring it into compliance with current federal and state dam safety standards, all while maintaining the flood prevention and recreation opportunities that are provided by the structure. We'll be discussing each of these needs in more detail on the following slide. One factor influencing dam performance design and safety is hydrology changes to the upstream watershed. The original drainage area from the 1960s to Matichek Dam was documented as 46 square miles. When we delineated the drainage area using available LIDAR data, that directly contributing drainage area jumped to 121 square miles. Now you may be asking, how could the drainage area have changed so substantially? Well, a lot of that is a reflection of the difference in design practices from the 1960s to Prawner Day. In the 1960s, it was common practice to account for the incremental drainage area downstream of upstream dams to the dam in question, in this case, the 46 square miles. Modern design practice accounts for the full drainage area reaching the dam, which is 121 square miles. Additional hydrology changes within the watershed include implementation of the Michigan Spillway Project. That project provides regulated discharges for approximately 172 square miles of drainage area, which you see as the green cross hatching on the map on the right. The maximum discharge that's allowed out of this area is 50 CFS and is regulated based on concerns downstream. Modern dam safety standards provide for capacity requirements for the principal spillway, the auxiliary spillway, and the freeboard capacity of dams, as well as the stability of earthen features such as the grass-lined auxiliary spillway on Matichek Dam. The required capacity for each of these is a direct reflection on the hazard classification of the structure itself. In the case of Matichek Dam, when we look at the principal spillway, which is the concrete riser structure and the conduit that takes flows through the embankment, there isn't sufficient capacity to meet either a significant or a high hazard designation. When we look at the auxiliary spillway, which is the grass line channel that routes flows around the dam during periods of excessive flows, there appears to be sufficient capacity to meet a significant hazard designation, but insufficient capacity to meet a high hazard designation. When we look at the freeboard capacity, or essentially the capacity required to pass through the dam without overtopping the embankment itself, there isn't sufficient capacity for the significant hazard or high hazard designations. When we look at the auxiliary spillway in terms of the stability of it, it appears there's potential for failure under both a significant hazard and a high hazard designation. Now jumping to the flood prevention purpose for Matichek Dam. Matichek Dam, as part of the overall Middle South Branch Forest River Watershed Work Plan, was aimed at primarily reducing flood damages along the Forest River further downstream, particularly near the communities of Forest River and Minto. In this area, there's limited floodplain capacity and flows tend to break out away from the channel. This results in excessive inundation of cropland, impacts to rural infrastructure and rural residences, and also impacts to the communities of Forest River and Minto. What we're looking at on the screen is the 10-year rainfall event, which is representative of four inches of rain over four days. This results in a total inundation over 13,000 acres and a potential inundated structure of 86 structures. The 10-year rainfall is often the target for providing flood damage reduction benefits for ag land within the Red River Basin. When we jump to a higher magnitude event or the 100-year rainfall, which is representative of nearly six and a half inches of rain over a four-day duration, the total inundation jumps to nearly 24,000 acres with an impacted structure count of 262. A 100 year rainfall event is more typical of when we're targeting critical infrastructure in the landscape, rural residences and communities for flood protection goals within the Red River Basin. It should be noted both the 100 year rainfall event and the 10 year rainfall event both assume that Matichek Dam is in operation today, meaning benefits provided by the current dam are reflective of the damages that we've just reviewed on these inundation slides. This is not only highlighting the need for continued rehabilitation of structures within the Red River Basin, but also continued progress on the 20% flow reduction goals that have been outlined through the Long-Term Flood Solutions Report. Matichek Dam was also constructed to provide recreation opportunities for area residences, primarily a fishery associated with the nearly 2,500 acre foot normal pool that's provided by the dam. Recently, concerns with the fishery have been brought forward in terms of long-term ability to maintain a fishery due to downward trending dissolved oxygen concentrations. These low dissolved oxygen concentrations have played a significant part in fish winter kills that have occurred both in the winter of 2017-2018 and the winter of 2018-2019. Because of these two back-to-back -back winter kills, it's estimated there is limited to no game fish species present within the reservoir at this time. This is important because nearly half the user days associated with the reservoir are a direct result of fishing. 
The Matichik Dam TMDL, completed by the North Dakota Department of Environmental Quality in 2017, attempted to diagnose what the issues are with the low dissolved oxygen concentrations within the reservoir. This resulted in nutrient loading being the primary factor affecting low dissolved oxygen levels. And a goal was established to reduce total nitrogen and total phosphorus by approximately 10% reaching the lake. When reviewing the upstream watershed, there's no known point sources for nutrient loading reaching Matichik Dam, and it's likely originating from non-point sources upstream of the dam. The rehabilitation of Matichik Dam is currently in the early stages of identifying alternatives to meet the needs we previously discussed. Now, I just wanna stress that this is currently under development. However, at this time, we have an idea of what the categories are that alternatives will fit within. The first of which is decommissioning or removal of the dam and restoration of the flood pool upstream. We'll also be evaluating rehabilitating the dam to a high hazard classification and also what happens if we can remove or protect flood risk downstream and rehabilitate to a lesser standard, in this case a significant hazard. And finally, we'll be evaluating what if no federal action is taken, meaning what will state and local dam safety officials have to do if no federal funds are available to rehabilitate Matichek Dam. As we develop alternatives for the rehabilitation of Matichek Dam, we'll continually be looking back at the needs that need to be addressed. From a dam safety perspective, we'll be considering things like embankment stability and seepage, spillway capacity requirements, spillway integrity and erosion potential, and deteriorating structural components. From a flood prevention standpoint, we want to look at maximizing the site performance based on hydrology as it exists today. If there are things that we can do to enhance the performance of the dam to increase the bang for the buck for rehabilitation, all the better. From a recreation standpoint, when we're looking at increasing dissolved oxygen levels that exist within the reservoir in order to provide a sustained fishery, we'll be looking at things like upstream treatment versus in-lake treatment as a means to reduce nutrient levels within the reservoir. Once a reasonable range of alternatives has been established for Matichek Dam, we'll begin to evaluate those alternatives on multiple categories, things such as costs and benefits, social concerns, cultural concerns, environmental impacts, and any other reasonable concerns that were identified during scoping. We'll evaluate each alternatives for pros and cons on each of these categories and determine what type of trade-offs may be associated with each alternative. Ultimately, our goal is to establish a preferred alternative that's locally acceptable, environmentally feasible, and provides the best bang for the buck for dollars invested. I just wanna stress that this process is still underway it's a work in progress, and we hope to have a solution for Matichek Dam established in the next 18 months. Jumping back to the seven dams that are currently in watershed planning within the Red River Basin, there's quite the funding need that's needed to fully implement the re rehabilitation alternatives that are expected out of each one of these structures. I just want to stress the numbers that we're discussing here today are very preliminary. The planning is still underway, and the planning will ultimately identify what the funding need is at each structure. In total, nearly $80 million of funding would be needed to implement rehabilitation on all seven of these structures, similar to Matichek Dam that we've discussed here today. Remember that that is just seven sites of the 132 sites that were identified for the purposes of providing flood control within the Red River Basin. Now, not all of these sites need rehabilitation to the scale of the seven sites we had previously discussed. However, it is important to ensure that we do not lose diligence on ensuring that the storage that exists within the basin today remains functional and operational into the future. When we talk about funding rehabilitation within the basin, there are several funding sources that are available, both from federal entities, the North Dakota State Water Commission, the state of Minnesota, the Red River Joint Water Resource District, the Red River Watershed Management Board, and local assessments. Ultimately, all these funding sources have limitations, therefore being proactive and identifying what your funding needs may look like into the future and planning accordingly are imperative to ensuring that we don't have a situation where a dam needs critical work in a critical situation. And finally, when we look at the storage that's been implemented since the 1950s, we have made quite a bit of progress to get to where we are today. And I think we all recognize that the ultimate goal is to move the available flood storage towards the 20% flow reduction recommendations. However, as we continue to try and push the needle forward, we need to ensure that we're also taking a look at the storage that's previously been implemented and applying funding accordingly to ensure that we don't lose ground on progress towards the 20% flow reduction goal.
In closing, I'd just like to say thank you for taking the time to listen to our discussion on dam rehabilitation in the Red River Basin. If you have any additional comments or questions that you'd like to discuss, don't hesitate to reach out to me on the phone number and email that you see on the screen. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference.